Good morning, Southern Baptist. It's great to have you guys here with us this morning as we worship the Lord Jesus Christ in music and the preaching of the Word. I hope you guys have a wonderful Sunday of worship in your homes with your families or whether you're on the road. Uh, hopefully you're not driving while you watch this, but it's going to be glad. It's glad that we're able to broadcast and you're able to watch it at your convenience. So hopefully you guys are having a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. Um, it would be even kind of cool if somebody was watching the service from a boat. Let us know if you're on a boat somewhere, whether fishing or skiing or something. So welcome to Southern Baptist this morning. Have a wonderful time of worship. Let me pray and we'll uh, get started. Father, I do thank you so much, God, that you are with us and you guide us and you direct us. And Father, I just pray that you would you be with us in our worship service and that you would change lives. And we ask it in your name. Amen. Now, real quick, I want to share with you our trivia question. What was our a uh, famous coach of Rush Springs High School football. What was his record when he retired? His total record. So that's the trivia question. If you get that right, we'll get you a gift certificate to Rush Springs Nutrition Center. Have fun. Enjoy the worship service.
Hey, good morning, Southern Baptist. I'm excited to let you know that we're going to be resuming our worship services June the 7th. Um, so I'll have details for you in the announcements immediately following the message. But the thing about this, the reason I even mentioned it in the middle of the message is this. I wanted to, as we've had this time off away from uh, church in the sense we've been, you know, worshiping through video and, and, and stuff like that. I, one of the things that I think it's been great about this is it's given us an opportunity to kind of examine why we go to church in the first place. Think about that for a second. I mean, I, have you ever asked yourself, why do I go to church anyway? What, what's the purpose of it? Why do I go? Um, why do I, is it because I like crowds? Is it because I like the free breakfast that they have on, on, and on Sunday mornings? Uh, why is it that I go to church in the first place? And, and I believe that the, first, the reason we go to church in the first place and the reason that we have a hunger and a desire to go there is pretty much the same uh, for each one of us. We want to be different. And I don't mean different like, uh, a strange person that walks into a convenience store while you're trying to get a Dr. Pepper and a, and a candy bar. No, I mean different like changed. We want to be changed. We don't want to be the same. And I believe that that's the universal reason many of us go to church, is to be changed, to experience life change, to be more patient with our children, to be, more, uh, to be less angry uh, over cir circumstances that we shouldn't be angry about. To try to uh, see, the, to allow God to change our morality from some of the secret things that we do that are sinful and, and reveal to us a need to change and to turn from those sins and become uh, washed and become clean. And I believe that that's all a part of the process of what church is about. And that's why God wants us to experience this life in Jesus Christ is that he can change us. So let's pray, and then we're going to spend some time in the Word talking about the God who changes us, God's plan for change. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you speak to us, guide us, and direct us as we study your Word today. Help us to, be, uh, help us to, to experience life change, and we ask it in your name. Amen. This week we're looking at, like I said before, and we've been studying all these names of God. And as, I was as we're studying them, we're finding that every name of God meets a deep need that we have as, as, as believers, as followers. Each one of the names of God uh, is associated with a deep spiritual need that we all possess. Today, I want, and today is no different. I want to talk about the deep need that we have for life change and how God is the God who changes us, who sanctifies us. That's the word that, uh, that the Bible uses a lot is the term, the theological term, sanctification. He, God is the God who changes us. And that word is Jehovah Midkadish. And that word means the God who changes us. You know, God wants to change you. If you're already a Christian, God is in the process of changing you. 
God is working. God is at work. That's the good news. That He's not done with you yet. He's not done with me yet. He's still uh, very much at work. And, uh, and if you're not a Christian, you're, you're in the right place right now just to listen to this message because we're going to talk about how you can experience life change in Jesus Christ. That's the important thing is God wants us not to... He loves us just the way we are. He wants, he wants us to join Him uh, and become a follower of Jesus Christ, and we don't have to change anything. He's, he's going to do all the work of changing our life. through and, and, and as a partner and working with us, we're going to see our lives changed uh, in, in Christ Jesus. And so look at the 2 Corinthians 5, 17, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I have it memorized in the King James Version. But here's a different translation I wanted to share with you of the, that passage of Scripture where it says this. What this means is that those who become Christians become new persons. That's exactly, you know, the old has passed away, all things are become new. We become new persons. They are not the same anymore, for the old life is gone, the new life has begun. I want you to circle old life and new life. The old life is gone, that's referring to the life without a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the old spiritual nature. That's the, uh, the new life has begun. We have a, a new nature in us. We have a, 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 our lives have not been reformed it, 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 per se. Our lives have been completely and utterly changed. The old life is gone. The new life has begun. This new life is a supernatural relationship with God. It's when God goes from, uh, we go from God's creation to God's child. And that brings me to this point. Not everybody is a child of God. You know, one time I was watching an episode of Oprah Winfrey. And she ended the segment on, we're all God's children. We're not. Not everybody is God's child. We're all created by God. But only those who have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ are God's children. We are adopted children of God through the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross. So I think it's very important that we understand we go from creation to child supernaturally through the relationship we have with Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul says in Philippians 3, 12-14, and he summarizes this very well. Look what he says. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. It's like he said, uh, you know, uh, he hasn't arrived. And that's good news for us because many of us, if you're like me, you're still on the journey. But I keep working toward that day when I finally will, uh, uh, when I will finally be all that Christ Jesus saved me for and wants me to be. No, dear brothers and sisters, I am not all I should be, but I am focusing all my energies on this one thing. Forgetting about the past, looking for toward the future or what lies ahead, I strain to reach the end of the race and receive the prize, prize which God through Jesus Christ is calling us up to heaven. Now, the big idea here is this. Life, uh, the life we're in is like a race. It's a new race in Jesus Christ. The once, the once you have that relationship with Jesus Christ, you begin a brand new race. And this new race is a journey. It's a process. God wants to change us through the working in our life. This process takes time. It's a journey through in faith. It's called, it's, it's a sanctification process. He wants to take your, you know, uh, he wants to take you and he wants to change you to be like his son, Jesus Christ. He wants to give you, uh, he wants to take your insecurity and change it to peace. He wants to change out the bitterness to goodness. He wants to take your lust and change it into genuine love. He wants to take the mean streak that you have and transform it into goodness. He wants to take our edgy personalities and transform it into patience. God is in the change business. That's what God wants to do in your life. He wants to change you. You know, 
Uh, he wants to take your anger and, and, and your rage and change it to gentleness. See, God's in the change business. Some of you are thinking, well, that might sound nice for you because, you know, you don't have much changing to do. Well, you don't, you don't understand everyone. Uh, you, you, you say, well, you don't understand all the changing that God has to do in my life. I don't. And you don't understand all the change that God's had to do in my life. It's that relationship with God. But God understands and God knows what needs to be done to change your life and my life. Now, there's two extremes that are, in, that are, are errors in the area of God changing uh, us in the, in, the, in the area of sanctification. The first extreme is that we just kind of sit back and let God do all the work. That's not true at all. Um, that, that's not in the Bible. God's not just going to do all the changing and we just kind of sit back on, in a lazy boy and just let him change my life. The second thing, the other extreme, is that the biblical position of sanctification is that there's God's part, uh, you know, uh, he saved us, and the other extreme is that we are just left to change ourselves. That's not true either. It takes both God's power. See, God's change works this way, excuse me. The biblical <clears throat> position of sanctification is that there is a God's part and there is an our part. Our part, God's part is, is his power. Our part is our cooperation. Let me say that again. God's part is his power. Our part is our cooperation. <coughs> we cooperate in this process of change, and, but God's power through his Holy Spirit controls the process. So I'm going to talk to you about five stages on the... Uh, on the spiritual life journey, and, and I'm going to talk about basically five action steps of the, ba of the, uh, the spiritual life journey. And uh, first of all, it's a journey. It's, a, it's, a, <clears throat> it's very much a, a journey. It's a, a passing through. It's a process. It's not an event. It's not a once-in-a-lifetime thing. It's a journey. It's not overnight. Uh, it, it happens through time. Look what uh, Philippians 1 says here. I, uh, he says, And I am sure that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Jesus Christ comes back again. Now, I want you to circle two words there. The first word is began. That's salvation. When God began the work, that is when you begin that relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. You have said to G yes to Jesus and he has become your Lord and Savior. Come into my life, forgive me of my sins, and boom, it begins. That's the, pro the big process begins. But then there's, I want you another word in that passage of scripture when he says continue. See, that is sanctification. That is the process. That's the journey. You know, have you ever been on a road trip with your kids and you don't even get as far as Duncan? And the kids are already saying, you know what they're going to say. You can say it right now in, in your room right now. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? You know, the, my kids, I've heard them say that so many different times. Here's the thing, though. The are we there yet statement is a sign of immaturity. It is a, it is a perfect picture of immaturity. See, this is the problem, I think, a lot of times with many Christians, and that's the reason that some, of, some Christians uh, or, or some people, uh, I use the word Christian loosely, some people began the, the Christian journey and they're nowhere to be found. They're no longer following Christ. They're nowhere in the church. They're no, you, you've seen it. I've seen it multiple times. The problem is, at some point, they go, are we there yet, God? And God it doesn't give them the satisfactory answer that they're looking for. And so they just walk away from the faith. That happens so often. Because they don't understand the fact that that are we there yet question is basically a sign of maturity. One of the biggest problems with many Christians is they walk away from God. They walk away from the church because of that immature question, are we there yet? Are you done yet? Here's the thing. <clears throat> God, until Jesus Christ comes back, we're never there yet. It's always going to be a process. 
from, from the moment you ask Jesus Christ to become your sa- Lord and Savior until the day you are taken to heaven, it's going to be a process of sanctification. It's a process of a journey. The good news is the point of being, uh, uh, you know, a, a journey is this. We're not, no, we're not there yet. <laughs> Everybody who's alive, if you're breathing right now, you're not there yet. You, you, you're still on, on the journey. It, we are all a work in process. Number two, set your sights on the final destination. Set your sights on the final destination. If you want to cooperate with God's change, you, got, you have to set your sights on the final destination. And, the, and this is not heaven, guys. You know, one of the things that's kind of bothered me through this whole COVID-19 thing is the comment that I hear so many people say, stay safe. And, uh, you know, I think one of the things that I, is flowing into all of our lives, and specifically the church, is this hunger and this desire for that four-letter word to be safe. And I'm going to be honest with you. Nowhere in the Bible does God ever teach that safety is, a prim- is one of his primary uh, points for us. Comfort is never on God's agenda for us. He is, on the, he is not in the comfort or safety business. God is in the transformational business. He's in the change business. And sometimes that may mean that you come across a life where it's not safe. Maybe it, it brings you to a point where it's, it's kind of dangerous and it's very uncomfortable. Let me give you an illustration why it's important to have the final destination and focus. When we take our, uh, our mission trips to Northwest Haiti, we go on sometimes a wonderful eight-hour bus trip that can turn into 15 hours and even longer. And the only way that I find to survive that miserable 15-hour bus trip from Port-au-Prince uh, up to uh, St. Louis is to focus on the final destination, that I'll finally get there, we'll finally be up, make it, it, it will finally arrive, we'll be driving through uh, St. Louis headed up to the mission. And so I think a lot of times <clears throat> we need to do that in our Christian lives now. We need to be understanding that t- times are tough, things are difficult, Sometimes we have to take our eyes off of what's going on now and get our eyes on what is, uh, is the final destination in God's plan for us. Look what he says in Hebrews 10.10. 10. And what God wants is for us to be made holy. Like I told you before. It doesn't say, and God wants you to be safe. And God wants you to be comfortable. And God wants you to be happy no it said god wants you to be made holy leviticus 20 says so set yourselves apart to be holy for i the lord am your god who makes you holy see the purpose the final destination is this wholeness this being holy That's what he wants us to be set apart. He wants us to be holy. He wants us, our final destination is Jesus Christ. Paul said it, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. What what he said was, for me to live is Jesus and to die is just more Jesus. The final destination has to be in view. You know, as we talk about change, uh, we're not talking about doing, guys. I think many times when you think about this, and you think about this final destination of being holy, you think about actions and word, uh, work, works and doing and doing and doing. What we're really actually talking about is not about doing, it's about being. It's about being. Don't confuse biblical uh, knowledge and religion with transformation of your heart. There are two different things. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, And as the Spirit of the Lord works within us, we become more like Him and reflect His glory even more. You know, when I became a brand new believer, all these people that memorized this scripture, man, to me, they were like the epitome of awesomeness. Then, whenever I went to seminary, I went to seminary, and guys would start talking about Aquinas, or they would be talking about Luther, or they would be talking about Calvin, just like they had breakfast with them this morning. 
And I would hold these guys with these, these great minds up here in this great uh, 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 achievement. And I would think, man, that's what is the, the, the epitome of the Christian faith. But here's the deal, guys. Knowledge and, and depth in uh, and, and, and learning the Word of God is important, yes. But I don't want us to ever confuse religion and biblical knowledge with true transformation. Here's the thing. You can know all the scripture. You can know all the church history. You can know all the things but have never applied it to your personal life. You can have it all underlined but not be living it. The point is not doing, it's being if you want a picture of a changed life, you show me someone who, is, when they're, when, who you know, is watching their life and they choose God's way instead of the way of sinful pleasure, instead of, 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 of what they're doing in their private life, what they're doing behind closed doors, how they treat other people. You can be a, 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 the most fundamental person in the world, and if you're mean to people, that makes absolute no difference. That's not godliness. That's just knowing a lot of scripture. Even the devil knows that. It's important that we are being, not just doing. The third thing that I want to talk about is ask God to help you with the roadblocks. And you say, roadblocks, that mean I'm going to have roadblocks? You're going to have roadblocks. Everybody has roadblocks. These are areas that slow down the movement. Slow down the journey. They stop the brakes on your progression. This is a, actually the roadblock. The roadblocks are just as much a part of the journey as the journey. It's important that we understand that the way that we deal with roadblocks is this is what we have to do is we have to get to the point where we ask God to help us with the roadblocks. We have to ask God to help us with the roadblocks. Uh, 2 Corinthians 7, he says, Let us purify ourselves with everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence or awe for God. Look at that word, everything. Everything that contaminates. These are roadblocks. What are the everythings that contaminate your character? What are they? You know, I, had, I, I think this is an important exercise for you to do. Uh, maybe today, maybe this weekend, if you're not going anywhere, sit down and ask yourself that st deep spiritual question. I've done this before. It wasn't a very pretty picture. I would, I, I, I would say I would not share these with you. But I can tell you, if you'll spend some time and ask yourself the serious questions, what are the roadblocks in my life? What are some of the things, the impurities? What are these uh, these everythings that contaminate my character. And do, let me ask you a question now. You've identified these roadblocks, but let me ask you a question. Do you really want to get past them? Do you really want to get past the roadblocks in your life? That, that's a good question because this is, the, this is the thing I want to ask you. Sometimes we like the way we feel when we engage in those things that contaminate our character. We like the way we feel when we run over people and treat them a certain way. We have a, a rush that comes from being the one who gets a, his way every single time. We have to deal, you know, I'll tell you right now, I, 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 I have to deal with the issue of anger all the time. And, the, and, and, and this is the thing, I liked the way I felt when I was angry. I liked the way it made me feel. There are people who are dealing with lust. They like the way lust makes them feel. So when you ask the question, what are my roadblocks? And then you begin to ask the question, do I really want to remove those? Then you have to ask the question, do I really want to remove them? Because do I like the way it feels when I do that? See, this is the thing. It's an inside problem, guys. It's not an outward problem. You can wear a Christian t-shirt. You can drive with a Christian bumper sticker. You can have the church that cares on the back window of your car. But that doesn't mean that you are not removing these character issues that are deep down inside that God wants to change in our life to make us more like his son, Jesus Christ, and to set us apart and make us holy. 
See, that's the asking God. Hey, look what he says here. Throw off all your evil nature and the, your former way of life. Look at that. Throw off your old evil nature and your former way of life. Look what he says. Which is rotten through and through, full of lust and deception. See, that, that former way of life is rotten through and through. See, this is the asking God part. We need to, the problem is, you know, I can remove the problem from my life, but the problem is it keeps coming back. It keeps returning. And so the important thing for me to do as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is to ask God, help me to remove, intervene, God. T take your sovereign hand and help me to remove this from my life, this this filthiness, this evil that contaminates my character. Help me to remove it from my life. Humble yourself and ask God, I can't do it on my own, God. You've got to remove it. You say, God, I am ready to get past this roadblock that is causing so much damage to me, to other people in my life, and keeping me from growing with you. That's one of the areas that I had to do with anger, and I still battle anger i still have to work through, through it with the roadblocks with god but i saw what the anger was doing to my relationships and to myself last scripture i want to challenge you with is proverbs 28 here it says people who cover their sins will not prosper but they will confess and forsake them they will receive mercy see I, there's many people that are going to be listening to this message and they're going to say man i don't have any roadblocks in my life well i can tell you right now you do and it's time for you to uncover those and not try to cover your sin because in order to grow in Christ Jesus, you're going to have to uncover those things. Number four, this is another part of the journey that you need to do in the, in the, in the journey of change is you need to learn how to refuel. Uh, you know, some friends of ours, uh, they come out and they visit us and I just talked to them uh, a few weeks ago uh, about one of their visits. And when they came out, I asked them, how many times did you stop for gas? And it was an astonishing few times that they had to stop for gas. And they made, made the, the trip in record time because they didn't, have, they didn't have to stop for gas. Well, I'm going to tell you something. When it comes to the journey of the Christian faith, you need to stop for gas daily, if not moment by moment. In the, in the, in, if you're traveling between here and Florida, it's great not to have to stop for gas. But I'm going to tell you something. When you're in the Christian life, you know, I think the journey is a great motif because this, in the journey of becoming holy, you have to stop and refuel daily. You have to do it daily. Because you know what? You don't want to be caught out there in the middle of nowhere like you're traveling across the desert or something with no gas in your car. You don't want to be caught in the middle of nowhere without fuel. There's some places in Oklahoma that are like that. If you don't get gas, if you think you're low and you're, you need to get between two places, I always thought about that with Wilson and Ringling. Between Wilson, Oklahoma and Ringling, if you didn't have gas, if you didn't have enough gas, you're not going to find anything because there's really nothing between those two towns. And it's important that you fuel every single day. We need to refuel every day. Look at this passage. God, he, God, renews my strength. He guides me along the right path. See, I need to be refueled. I need to be connected. Uh, 2 Peter 1, as we know Jesus better, his divine power gives us everything we need for living a godly life. So we make every effort to apply these promises to our lives. And he says, then your faith will produce a life of moral excellence. A life of moral excellence leads to knowing God better. Knowing God leads to self-control. Self-control leads to patience, patience, endurance, and patient endurance leads to godliness. Godliness needs, leads to love, uh, to love uh, for other Christians. And finally, you will grow to have a genuine love for everyone. See, this Bible change process is not so that you can somehow or another sit back and say, I have arrived. No, this spiritual process of growing in faith is for the purpose of, in the context of community. It's there so that we can love others with a genuine love. So that brings me to the last point, and that is you need to pause 
Not only do you need to, to refuel daily, but you need to pause along the way to celebrate the progress. If you're a Christian, God, you know, uh, God has worked in your life whether you think so or not. There are many areas that you don't even realize that God's worked in your life. And, you, you know, uh, it, you need to, you need to, to realize that it, sometimes you've got to stop along the journey and celebrate the progress. Maybe you need to uh, uh, celebrate the fact that this weekend, hey, it's Memorial Day weekend, and you may be involved in, in, a, in a place where there's traffic or something like that, and, uh, and somebody pulls out in front of you, and now... Uh, you know, some one, two, three, five years later, you're waving instead of using your hand in other gestures. That's progress. You may not get as angry with people as you have in the past. Maybe you are able to uh, turn off certain things on your television or your computer that you shouldn't be watching. These are things that you need to take an opportunity and take a time to celebrate the progress that God has been doing in your life. Psalm 40, O oh Lord my God, you have done many miracles for us. Your plans for us are too numerous to list. If I tried to recite all your wondrous, wonderful deeds, I would never come to the end of them. Look at that. He says, you know, we need to take time and pause and thank God for all the wonderful miracles that he has done for us. You know, there's different things that you can do to celebrate. Just saying, God, thank you. Maybe lifting your hands in worship and just praising him for what he's done. Maybe just giving him glory. Maybe just telling someone else about how wonderful God is and how he's done, what he's done for you. There, you know, we need to take time and spend the moments celebrating the progress that God has done. Look at Galatians 5. When the Holy Spirit controls our lives, he will produce this kind of fruit in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That is one of the areas that I use. My wife actually uses this as well in measuring our progress. How, mo how much more loving am I? How much more joyful am I? How much more peaceful am I? This is an opportunity to see where God has done his work in my life. Now I want to close with this. Where are you on this spiritual journey? Let's personalize this. Where are you? I mean, this is a time where you can stop. Put your name uh, to, next to some of these points. Man, are you, are you stuck in a, in a roadblock right now? Are you grateful for the journey? Are you, uh, are you uh, ready for God to change some of that, the roadblocks? Are you ready for God to take some of that away? Where are you? Are you celebrating where you, uh, you may not be where God wants you to be right now, but you are headed in that direction and you're so grateful that you've come so far? See, I think that's the important thing. It's not always looking at how much you have left to go, but looking at where you've been and where God has taken you and how he's working in your life. Some of you need to realize that this is a part of the journey and I just need to surrender to what God's doing in my life. Some of you need, you know, you, you know you've got your, you're in, a, in the stopping point and you just have to realize that's part of the journey and that God's still working in my life. Some of you, maybe you're listening to this and you haven't even started the journey yet. You haven't even began. You don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ today, right now. I mean, this is a great opportunity, May the 24th. This is a great opportunity for you to ask Jesus Christ to come into your life, to give your life to him and to trust him and, and to become, begin a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and to get on the journey, to begin that process of, of having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because I'm going to tell you something. There is no change without Christ there's just not you can't you can't and then and I'm going to be honest with you too you think well I'm going to I'll, I'll stop this in my life or I'll fix this in my life or I'll clean this up and then I'll come to Christ no there is no you can't be clean enough to come to Christ you just need to come to Christ the way you are 
There's an old song that used to be sang at, at uh, Billy Graham Crusades, Just As I Am. That's the way God wants you. He wants you to come to Him just the way you are. So tonight, this morning, whatever you're listening to this, I want to ask you, have you began a personal relationship with Christ? And what's keeping you from doing that? Why don't you repeat this prayer after me? Jesus, I want to become a child of God. I thank you that you have provided the opportunity for me to become a child of God by dying on the cross, paying for my sins. I am trusting you as my Lord and Savior. I am giving you my sin in exchange for your forgiveness. I'm giving you my brokenness in exchange for your newness. And I am trusting you as my Lord and Savior. And I am placing my faith in you. It's, the Bible teaches us if we will confess the Lord Jesus with our mouth and, and confess him, then he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to give us this righteousness that he possesses. And I pray that you are trusting Christ this morning as your Lord and Savior in beginning that journey. Let somebody know. Text me, email me. I'm here at the office. You can call me, 580-476-3243. You can text me. You can email me. You can message us at the church. Let someone know that you've given your life to Christ. And I encourage you to take the next step. The next step is following him in believer's baptism. He says, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before the Father. Baptism is our coming out party. It is our opportunity to let the world know that we've become a follower of Jesus Christ. I hope that as, you, as a Christian, you will re remember that you're still on a journey. You haven't arrived yet. You're still working towards, God's working in you, that holiness. Let me close us in one final prayer, and then we're dismissed. Father, speak to us like only you can. Guide us and direct us. Help us to get involved in, in, with you in the change of our lives. And we ask it in your name. Amen. Good morning, Southern Baptist. Hopefully you enjoyed the wonderful time of worship through music and through the message. I have a few quick announcements. Number one, um, this is pretty exciting news. I want to go ahead and do it first. Uh, we are going to go back to our worship services in the facility, in the building, starting Sunday, June the 7th. Sunday, June the 7th, we're going to Restart worship services in our facility. Here's how it's going to go down. Uh, we're going to have two services. One will be at 9 a.m. and one will be at 11 a.m. The first service, we want to have a gospel hymn service. This will be uh, primarily singing from the hymnals. And uh, it, uh, we're kind of excited about that because... Um, that is a wonderful way of worshiping God through song. And so we're going to be doing our gospel hymn service. That service we would like to be a service for those who would be more susceptible to catching the COVID-19 virus. If, if, they were, if it was somebody that maybe they're uh, older in years or they have a immune issues or something, this would be a wonderful service for them if they're more susceptible to the, the COVID-19 virus. The other service would be at 11 o'clock. That is our contemporary worship service time. It will be more open for uh, young families, uh, younger folks, people who are, are not as uh, susceptible to the virus. And, and we're just trying to offer options. Now, here's the thing. Both services, the gospel hymn service and the contemporary worship service, will be online live. We will continue our online ministry uh, for both services. So the 9 a.m., we will have uh, the message will be the same message. The music's uh, going to be more of a gospel hymn style service. The music will be different, but the message will be the same. The same is true with a contemporary service. It will be the same message with just more of a contemporary style music. And we're going to have some other things that I want to talk about in the, as we get, begin to ramp up that service. Uh, there'll be some things that if you want to serve, there's going to be some great ministry opportunities if you want to help us. We need help. Uh, we're going to be cleaning between the services. 
We're going to need help uh, with a lot of different things as they come up. And so if you're interested in serving, we want you to help us out in this new, uh, it's a new world we're living in, and we're just going to be doing some different things. Now, these two services are going to be for the month of June. As that progresses, we will look at it at, uh, sometime in the late part of June and decide what phase we're going to go into for July. But right now, for the month of June, we'll have two services, 9 and 11. Uh, the, fall, the Oklahoma Baptist Convention released the information last week. No False Creek. Uh, False Creek has been contem- uh, completely canceled. Um, the other announcement that I have is for youth. Youth uh, primarily now are going to be meeting at the park for the rest of the summer. And uh, so as, as well as weather permitting, uh, there will be other venues. They may use the uh, Life Center. Uh, we're trying to practice social distancing while yet they're able to get together. And so uh, there's going to be a few of our Sunday school classes that will probably be starting back in those types of venues, whether it be at uh, the teacher's home or someone's home. Uh, that's kind of what, the, what we're going to be doing in our Sunday school classes. We're going to be meeting outside in my, at my home. We'll keep the social distance going, but we will have a live, uh, we'll be all there together. So uh, I, I check with your Sunday school teacher as, as, uh, as those, uh, they, the teachers are making those decisions. Um, but the youth will be meeting at 6 o'clock on Wednesday night uh, at the park. Uh, as far as we know right now, that's the best place for them to meet. The other announcement that I have is we're still, uh, we still have not made any concrete decisions about Vacation Bible School. And the reason for that is Vacation Bible School is a worker intensive ministry. And a lot of our workers are of different age groups. And so we want to make sure that we keep our workers safe. So we're still looking at Vacation Bible School. No decisions made on that at this time. The answer to our trivia question, Coach Tunnel's record when he retired, uh, the best we could find out in the research we've done was 322 wins. 137 losses and seven ties. So if you got that right or somewhere ballpark it, I'll still give you a, a gift certificate to the Rush Springs Nutrition Center. So this is our, our last uh, service that we're pre-recording, um, but we will be having our worship service on May the 31st at 11 o'clock. We will live stream. We will live stream that service. And so um, as we get ready, we're going to go through. It'll be a test of our live streaming capabilities. So be patient with us. This is a new ministry that's growing every week. And so we're going to live stream that uh, May service. We may, uh, if everything is able to work out, we may do the 9 and the 11 like we're going to be doing on June the 7th. I don't want to say that for sure. But we're going to try to live stream both services so we may practice both services. So that's kind of our announcements for right now. Continue. Man, it's been awesome what God's been doing through you in reaching people, giving, uh, prayer. Uh, God is is so at work. And then things, you know, you can look at this as a bad thing or you can look at it as an opportunity. And I believe that God has used this opportunity to show us a, a fresh how important church is in our life. So it's wonderful to be a pastor here, and I'm thankful that you give me the opportunity to be your pastor. And so have a wonderful week. God bless.